going to mug me? I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the decent marathon. Download Veely now. Three centuries after the first discoveries, Egypt continues to fascinate us. Every month that goes by reveals new treasures buried under the desert sand. The fragment of nose was found in the area during an archaeological dig, so it was stuck back on. It hadn't gone far. Temples, pyramids, necropolises, and ancient cities are just some of the wonders that bear witness to the splendor of past pharaohs and their heirs. The Greeks used to make cakes called pyramids. And when they came to Egypt, they found colossal stone structures in the shape of their cakes. So they gave them the same name. This ancient civilization, which was thought to have been lost, is constantly reinventing itself in the Egypt of the 21st century. We are going to travel through time and space to rediscover it. When he was crossing the land of the pharaohs in around 450 BC, Herodotus proclaimed that Egypt was a gift from the Nile. Call visitors, past and present, he was struck by the contrast between the luxuriance of the banks of the Great River and the aridity of the desert surrounding them. These inhospitable expanses cover 96% of the country and only 1% of the population lives there. Since the dawn of time, Egyptians have feared the desert. It is the world of the dead, the kingdom of the god Seth, who tried to kill his brother Osiris, who symbolized fertile, nourishing soil. This religious myth reflects the ancestral wariness of the Egyptians for these hostile lands. And yet no pharaoh, sultan, or modern-day leader has been able to rest until they have attempted to tame the Sahara, which means desert in Arabic. It is essential to the Egyptian economy. Since antiquity, slaves, precious woods, and wild animals have passed through it, along trails linking the oases. It is also a gateway for foreign invaders and the land of the nomads that sedentary Egyptians are so wary of. Despite the military presence, Egyptians from the Nile have never really succeeded in controlling this arid land. Today, it is still a place fraught with danger and rebellion. In Cairo, the overpopulated capital of modern-day Egypt, the desert and its dangers seem very far removed from people's day-to-day -day concerns. And yet, it is just there, on the outskirts of the city. As you go upriver towards the south, the River Nile takes on the appearance of a green snake surrounded by hostile lands. One hour from Cairo, the Fayoum Oasis is the first refuge for the living from the dead. The desert surrounding it is particularly arid. Sometimes it doesn't rain for five years. And when the heavens finally open, all hell breaks loose. The water hurtles in torrents along these wadi with untold violence leaving a lunar landscape in its wake. Wadi al-Hitan hasn't always been the desolate land we see today. A long time ago, it was a sanctuary for some massive animals. We find wonderful bone preserved. And if you go over there, you would see also bone still in the rock. And you see the tissue. Maybe it's a vertebra uh, of a whale. Look at here. One here, one there, over there. Basically everywhere. This is why it's called Valley of the Whale. Forty million years ago, 
we are standing on the bottom of the ocean. So the water was covered most of Egypt at that time. And these, all of these beautiful creatures were swimming all over the place here. We are here looking at the most beautiful fossils in Wadi Hitan. This is the largest whale, largest marine mammal, 80 meters long, that lived uh, 40 million years ago in this place. You can here look at the skull over there, and the tail is just over there. So we are in the stomach area. You see the arms over there the both arms, the fins, and the legs would be really over there, really tiny legs, uh, comparing to this, this huge animal. Professor Salam has crossed a vast area of the Egyptian deserts in search of fossils. A few years ago, he struck lucky. He was the first Egyptian to have found a new species of dinosaur. He has been something of a celebrity in his country ever since. In 2018, we found a dinosaur skeleton in the late Cretaceous area, which is a really a 73 million years old skeleton. It's a plant eater dinosaur. We named it Mansurasaurus after my university and also named it the species Shahini after my wife name. It took millions of years for the sea to recede from Wadi al hetan giving way to terra firma, a series of different climates followed in Egypt. First the jungle, then forests colonized this part of the world. But in 5000 BC, the temperatures suddenly soared and desertification occurred, forcing the majority of the population to settle along the banks of the River Nile. It is perhaps this change in climate which is at the origin of Egyptian civilization. In this confined space, there was a need to organize a society, creating a strong royal power around a pharaoh. The desert took a while to colonize Egypt. The Giza Plateau didn't become arid until 1000 BC. The foot of the pyramids was in the savannah. Egyptians used to rub shoulders with the sort of animals now found in East Africa. They are depicted in bas reliefs, offering their dead various species of gazelle and hyena, which they are thought to have tamed and even eaten. Desert animals such as horned vipers or jackals are also present. Of all the Egyptian deserts, the Libyan desert is the most feared. It covers an area of over three million square kilometers. The chances of survival are slim for travelers who get lost in its vastness. Their only hope is to find an oasis such as the one at Dakhla. Dakhla is a veritable peace haven, luxuriance in the face of chaos. The oasis owes its lushness to the work of humans who, over the millennia, have irrigated it and landscaped it. These palm groves stretching as far as the eye can see are the fruits of their labors. The desert climate is perfect for dates. El Noir Farm has planted 50,000 date palms. This plant is the emblem of the oases. It has so many uses, even for weaving hats as protection from the sun. The 
Oasis dwellers are dependent on date palms. They cultivate other crops too, such as wheat and rice, which are mainly for their own consumption. But their main source of income comes from date palms. Our dates are exported all over the world, to the Arab world, of course, to Morocco and the United Arab Emirates, but also to Russia. They are even starting to be exported to Europe. Thanks to the quality of our dates, Dakla Oasis is on the regional map and even the international one. I haven't left the oasis for two years. Before that, I was traveling for five years. I was an engineer in the oil industry. I used to travel to Cairo a lot, but I prefer life in the oasis with its calm and serenity, far from the crowds and the noise. The technique used for picking dates has barely changed since the days of the pharaohs. Dates are still popular products. In ancient Egyptian depictions of their visions of paradise, date palms had pride of place next to the fields of flax and wheat, laden with goodness. Oases like the one at Dakla might well have inspired Allah's sensual paradise, a shady garden in which you only need to reach out a hand to pick the juicy fruits. This oasis may not be that nirvana, but the 8,000 inhabitants of Dakla have still chosen to stay here, far from a world that is in perpetual motion. Here they are spread over 17 villages, of which Kassa is the oldest and most beautiful. Built on the ruins of a Roman fortress, this medieval village has retained some of the character of those fortifications. Today, it is virtually uninhabited, Sabi, the keeper of the site, is one of the very few visitors to this abandoned maze. This medieval town is the symbol of the Dakla oasis. Lots of tourists love this ancient city. It is atypical, and its houses and streets radiate a unique atmosphere. You see this? That's palm wood. That's the wood that was most often used here. There are very few houses with inscriptions like this. Wealthy people put up these signs with poems or verses from the Quran. You no longer see this type of inscription on the facade. Wood is hardly ever used either. Everything is modern. Kassa was settled in the 8th century AD, but it didn't reach its peak until the 16th century during the Ottoman Empire, as proved by the madrasa which served as a school in the mornings and a court of justice in the afternoons. Muslim judges, or Qadis, used to try cases in an alcove with the witnesses appearing before them. The defendants waited in two separate prisons, the women's prison and the men's prison. What strikes casual visitors to this ancient city is that everything has been preserved in its original state, as if the inhabitants have only just left. Here we are in a communal mill. This is how it worked. 
There was a cow turning the millstone to grind the wheat. The other job consisted of passing grains of wheat through this hole using this pendulum. This piece of wood can be adjusted to suit the height of the millstone, which determines the fineness of grain of the flour. This mill has been abandoned for a hundred odd years. Nowadays, modern machinery is used to grind wheat or rice. Everything is electric. There were several reasons why the inhabitants abandoned this medieval city. Adobe is a very fragile building material. When it rains, which is rare, the walls need to be rebuilt. Modcons also played an important role. Running water, electricity and mains drainage managed to convince the more reticent among them. Today, only three or four families still live in this historic city centre. A few artisans have chosen to stay here to work. This potter's studio is less noisy than a blacksmith's, but still, for thousands of years, pottery has been essential for life in the desert. We make carafes, jugs, and jars, Anything you can make out of clay to keep water in. There didn't used to be fridges or metal containers to keep water in. But people are rediscovering the benefits of pottery. Doctors recommend that you drink water from pots for their mineral properties. The ancient Egyptians used pottery as ice boxes, as backpacks, and as flasks. It served every purpose. People kept all sorts of foodstuffs in it, such as meat or dried fish. Without it, there would have been no trade. The jars were a means of exporting oil or wine. Wooden barrels weren't invented until much later by the Gauls. We are sadly the last generation of potters. After us, there will be no one. It's a difficult skill to master. You have to learn it when you're young. You can't do it when you're older. It's over. No one wants to learn anymore. As with most oases, mass tourism and packed tourist coaches never make it as far as Dakla. That's what Maged likes about it. This Egyptian guide has made a bold choice to show discerning travelers another side to Egypt off the beaten track. When you travel from one oasis to another, you see only desert. Then suddenly, you come to another oasis with its lush vegetation at that moment. The oasis takes on the full meaning of the term. I never cease to be amazed by the peace and serenity, by this return to nature, the purity. I come here to cleanse myself of all the stresses of the city, all the day-to-day -day worries. I come to this region to recharge my batteries.
You might imagine the inhabitants of oases to be completely self-sufficient, but there are many outside influences here, the most important coming from the inhabitants of the Nile Valley. In Dakhla, archaeologists have discovered traces from the days of the pharaohs dating back to 246 BC. The majestic tombs of ancient rulers show just how important this region was for central government. We are in front of the Mastaba of Remtika, who was the governor of the oasis during the 6th dynasty, under the reign of Pepi II. Just next to it, you can see another Mastaba. The word Mastaba now refers to the upper part, which is this rectangular shape. The Mastaba of Remtika is missing that part. Its collapse is what led to the cave being protected. Mastabars, which are these rectangular edifices, surmounted the tombs of pharaohs from the 1st and 2nd dynasties in around 3000 BC, until a genius architect came and revolutionized these royal burial grounds. Imhotep, who worked for the pharaoh Djoser, came up with the idea of stacking the mastabars on top of one another, thus creating a pyramid shape. This pyramid, with its different levels, was the first of its kind in Egypt. There are over a hundred pyramids in the country. Latterly, the pharaohs chose to be buried in the Valley of Kings. What all these periods have in common is that the burial grounds are always in the middle of the desert. The idea was to preserve the agricultural land on the banks of the Nile, which was already limited, and also to protect the mummies from the damp, which is their worst enemy. So the desert naturally became the kingdom of the dead. We are now about seven meters below ground level. On this wall, we can see a very traditional scene. The sort found on all the tombs from the Old Kingdom. In the main passageway, there was always a portrait of the owner of the tomb. So that's Remtika with his wife opposite him. The scene is quite damaged, but we can see that she is bringing a lotus flower to her nostrils to inhale its scent. From the Old Kingdom onwards, the walls of these private tombs would have shown a variety of scenes, depicting daily life and sometimes the funeral, whereas the walls of royal tombs featured exclusively texts and funeral scenes. So if all that had remained in Egypt were the royal tombs, we would have missed out on all the information gleaned from these fabulous scenes of daily life. For example, these scenes of ploughing. We can see a plough here with some cattle. There are hunting scenes here too, like everywhere else. Here in the middle of the desert, it's even easier to go hunting. It was one of their favourite sports. The governors, who were representatives of the king, built such elaborate tombs because the oases were vital to the pharaohs. This region is situated on a very important trade route called Darb el Arbaim, meaning 40-day route. It was the caravan trail that connected what is now the region of Asyut with Darfur and Sudan. All the goods from Africa, which were coveted at that time, ebony, ivory, gold and exotic animals, were transported along that route and it was such an important trade route that the omnipresence and power of the state was very much in evidence. There were control posts and toll booths all along the trade route, which just shows how important it was to the kings and pharaohs who lived miles away from this region, because the seat of power was in Memphis, which was situated in what is now Greater Cairo, but they felt the need to demonstrate their power all along the Darb el Arbaim trade route. So, the administration was established in Dakla very early on, but the same is not true of another oasis, situated over 500 kilometers from Cairo. Egypt didn't gain control of Siwa until the 6th century BC. 70 kilometers from the Libyan border, 
Siwa has long been protected by the dunes of the Great Sand Sea that surrounds it. And yet, in the middle of this inhospitable world, small lakes are gradually appearing. They are a reminder of the sea that once covered the desert millions of years ago. Egyptian tourists love the scary experience of coming here from Cairo. Even with its hot water springs, they see the desert as a place fraught with danger. In the distance, we can just make out Lake Siwa. The water is so abundant here that, due to a lack of drainage, it forms saltwater lakes. The town centre is a calm place. The seaweeds are by nature placid. This is a far cry from the frenzy of the big cities. This serenity is embodied in the 7th century Charlie Fortress, which overlooks the town. Built from blocks of clay mixed with salt, it has gradually crumbled over the centuries. Doha is a tour guide who encourages tourists to take their time and appreciate this special atmosphere. When tourists first came here, they are fascinated by the fact that there is barely any transition between the interminable desert and this lush green oasis. There is a very clear dividing line between the two. There are 281 springs here, and the inhabitants of Siwa live among them. Some of these springs, spouting up all over the oasis, serve as natural swimming pools for passing bathers. There is one whose popularity has never waned, because here you feel as if you are swimming in the wake of Egypt's greatest queen. We are here beside a spring known as the Sun Spring, or Cleopatra's Spring. Some people say that Cleopatra came here to bathe. She took great care of herself. She used to bathe in ass's milk, perfumed with lotus flowers. This spring is one of the best-loved springs by Egyptians because they feel as if they're following in Cleopatra's footsteps and making themselves beautiful. People love to swim around the spring. These springs are very relaxing places with the water and the palm trees that surround them. Cleopatra, the penultimate queen of the Hellenistic dynasty of Ptolemy, may never have bathed at Siwa, but the Greek influence is apparent, particularly in the oasis main necropolis. The Hill of the Dead overlooks the town. Archaeologists have listed 1,500 tombs there. Many of them are damaged. The mountainside still bears the scars of all the unofficial digs carried out by seaweeds over the centuries. Tomb robbers removed the bas reliefs and sold them to foreigners. By some miracle, Siamun's tomb remains intact. The first thing you see when you go in is a typically Egyptian symbol, Newt, the goddess of the sky who eats the sun every night and gives birth to it again every morning in the form of a falcon. The decorations on the walls evoke the Hellenistic era, curly hair, beards and moustaches, Greek togas. The tomb dates from the Libyan period, a time when there were lots of Greek. Further on, a goddess under a sycamore tree is carrying a vase, from which, in between two trickles of water, a chain of anks is flowing, a sign of life in ancient Egypt, reminding us that in the past, just like today, the inhabitants of these oases were aware of their good fortune. But Siwa's 3,200 inhabitants have had to learn to live a life cut off from everything. It wasn't until 1984 that a tarmac road was built, linking them to the rest of the world. 
and it wasn't until 1987 that they discovered the joys of electricity. Perhaps it is that isolation which has preserved this unique culture. Siwa is home to the only Berber community in Egypt, the most eastern community in North Africa. Berbers are present throughout the Maghreb, as far west as Mauritania and as far south as Niger. Yusuf is an ardent defender of this culture and upholds all aspects of it. This lunchtime, he is entertaining the children of his family during their school holidays. To please his nephews, nieces and his own children, he has chosen a dish that is typical of Siwa. Now that I have covered them with sand, my work is done. We will dig them out in about an hour's time. The most important thing about this recipe is that it stays well sealed. If there is a leak, the chickens will be too dry. When Yusuf speaks to his brothers, sons and nephews, even though they can all speak Arabic, he prefers to use a local Berber dialect called Siwi. Most people here speak Siwi at home. Some people teach their children to say dad in Arabic. But I teach them the Siwi word, ab. They need to learn Siwi so they don't forget their roots. They will learn Arabic at school anyway. The advantage of the Siwa Oasis is that it is far from everything. When tourists come here and spend a bit of time with us, we influence them rather than them influencing us. One thing is certain, if we lived near a city, we would struggle to preserve our traditions and customs. The gentleness of the inhabitants of Siwa is in stark contrast to the harshness of their environment. The lake, a symbol of the oasis, is not the haven of peace it first appears to be. In this salty water, no fish or amphibian can survive. The salt covers the banks and the surface of the water like a shroud. But the seaweeds have turned it to their advantage. Egyptians have been eating salt since Neolithic times, supplied by the inhabitants of the oasis. Salt mining is still Siwa's main industry. You start by digging a pond, and then you hit the layer of salt. At this stage, the salt you extract is still brown because it contains soil. To wash it, you have to rinse it in water. We use the mechanical digger to give it about 15 rinses. When the salt is nice and white, we pile it up and leave it to dry. Salt from Siwa is appreciated for its flavor, but large quantities of it are exported to Europe or Canada where it is simply used to de-ice the roads in winter. This big machine is a grinder. This is where the salt crystals are ground. This is a 12 caliber grinder. There are lots of different calibers, from the highest to the lowest, which is used to make table salt. For us, salt is a gift from God. Ever since it was discovered here in Siwa, everyone has profited from it. Moreover, whatever we mine is replaced every year thanks to sedimentation in the lakes nearby. It really is a godsend for the oasis and for the local economy. Exporting salt has been going on for a long time. In the first century AD, this product started circulating around the Mediterranean basin. The Siwa Oasis, like all the oases, 
makes most of its income from trade. Ever since antiquity, Siwa has been forging links between North Africa and Egypt, exporting salt, dates, olives, oil and wine. Four kilos for a tenner. Four kilos for a tenner. Four kilos for just a tenner. You heard, four kilos for a tenner. This is as good as it gets, boss. You won't find cheaper. You won't find cheaper elsewhere. Egypt's caravan trails have been trade routes for 4,500 years. Nowadays, goods are transported along tarmac roads. All you need is a lorry. But for a long time, the caravans consisted of donkeys until they were replaced by another animal, which only came to be tamed later in 1000 BC. Dromedaries have adapted to the desert. This animal brought wealth to the oases. It can carry a load of 250 kilograms and swallow 135 liters of water in just a few seconds, allowing it to last several days in the hot sun. The Bedouins have made it their mascot. These nomads rarely come near the oases unless it is to tend to the well-being of their favorite animals. We have rented this plot of land in the oasis to use as pasture. The dromedaries need to eat fresh grass. We accompany the animals. This is more than a job. It is our life. We take care of our animals because our lives depend on these dromedaries. In the past, everything was linked to the dromedaries. Meat, milk. They even protected humans from storms and hardship. People used to ride on their backs. They transported people's worldly goods, even crops. Dromedaries can carry anything. I'm getting them ready to spend the night here. I have to tie them up. Otherwise, they might wander off and get lost. To be honest with you, I don't really have anywhere to put them. I'm not really settled in the region. That's just how it is. I don't settle anywhere. Every day, I stay somewhere new. <laughs> In theory, all Bedouins know how to take care of dromedaries. But the younger generation is losing this expertise. Take young Mahmoud here. His grandfather kept dromedaries, but he didn't have time to teach him. He's been accompanying me for a month now. He is learning techniques for approaching them and communicating with them, but he's still a bit scared of them. He'll soon get used to them. Nomads from the eastern and the western desert filled ancient Egyptians with fear and mistrust. They had a reputation for being versatile, quick to help invaders and to take up arms no matter what the occasion. Invaders often arrived via the desert, with the Nubians coming from the south and the Libyans from the west. In the Medinet Harbu temple in Luxor, bas reliefs praising Ramesses III tell the story of his victories over the desert people. The Libyans can be recognized by their beards and the Nubians by their black African traits. Further on, a scribe is carrying out a macabre task. He is counting a pile of sawn off hands to draw up an inventory of the number of enemies killed. Throughout their long history, the Egyptians haven't always succeeded in holding off invaders. 
the Persians, Greeks, and Romans all settled for long periods in the land of the pharaohs. They all tried to control these arid stretches, a source of instability for the country, but very few conquerors dared to go there in person. It was the desert, stretching back thousands of kilometers behind this lake, that nearly killed Alexander the Great. When he finally arrived here, he consulted the oracle of the god of Siwa. This was in around 331 BC. Alexander the Great had just toppled the Persian Empire, which Egypt was a part of. To legitimize his rule, he appeared before the oracle of Ammon in Siwa, which, along with the oracle in Delphi, was the most prestigious oracle of the ancient world. In this temple, the Greek conqueror hoped to direct his questions to Ammon, the most important god in ancient Egypt. Like anyone else who came here, including the priests who worked in these temples, Alexander the Great had to go down into this well to perform his ablutions before he could go and consult Ammon. This is the sanctuary. In the middle stood the statue of the god Ammon. Alexander the Great went to ask his questions. He had two questions in mind. The first was to ask the name of those who had killed his father. And the second was to ask whether he could avenge his father. Ammon told him repeatedly that his father wasn't dead. His father was with the gods. Alexander really liked that response. And the second response he got was that he was the son of a god. That was the ideal response. Thinking he was like the pharaohs, he thought he had the right to govern the whole country. These questions weren't just personal, they were also political. He needed validation and the agreement and acceptance of an Egyptian god. Alexander must have heard an actual voice answering his questions, but it wasn't the voice of a god. The priests at the oracles used various devices to trick their visitors. Some even hid inside hollow statues and made them speak. In Siwa, the system was more rudimentary, but just as effective. When Alexander the Great came here, the statue was over there. The priest accompanied him to the statue and then climbed up there by a back route that was hidden, of course. The priest was able to speak without Alexander the Great seeing him, though he thought it was the voice of the god speaking to him. In reality, more than the god Ammon, it was the clergy that interested Alexander. By finding favor with the priests, he was assured of their precious support to reign over these mystical Egyptians. In the Karga oasis in southern Egypt, other invaders have left their mark. The Romans were the last conquerors of the kingdom of the pharaohs. Following the example of their predecessors, they did their utmost to protect this distant frontier of their vast empire. The imposing Roman fortress overlooking the oasis protected the nearby caravan trail. Like Alexander the Great, the Romans were willing to reconcile with Egyptian beliefs. In the middle of the fortress, they erected a temple in the best ancient Egyptian tradition. It is dedicated to Ammon for the Egyptians and to Jupiter for the Romans. A new religion soon upset this established order. From the third century AD, the Karga Oasis became a refuge for early Christians fleeing violent persecution by the Romans. The necropolis of El Bagawat, with its 200 tomb chapels, bears witness to a surprising continuity. Like the ancient Egyptians, the Christians came to bury their dead in the desert. The oldest tombs on this site date back to the late 3rd, early 4th centuries AD. Later in the 5th century, the Nestorians came in. 
Nestorius was the bishop of Constantinople, and he was declared a heretic at Ephesus in 431. So this site was occupied first by Christians fleeing persecution by Roman pagans, and later by Christians fleeing persecution by other Christians who had different ideas about the nature of Christ. Nestorius declared that Mary was the mother of mankind and not the mother of God. This site is remarkable. It's unique. As you can see, these tomb chapels were more or less elaborate, depending on the wealth of the families. Some even have courtyards, with columns at the entrance to the tomb, whereas others are really quite modest. Some of these tomb chapels have been painstakingly decorated. Visitors can still admire these 1,600-year-old paintings, reflecting the faith of these early Christians. Here we see Moses guiding the people of Israel to their fate of having to wander in the wilderness for 40 years in the Sinai Desert, pursued by an army of pharaohs. This is the scene that has made this chapel famous. There is perhaps a link to be made between this flight into the Sinai Desert and the flight here towards another desert with its oases. Here we have a very interesting detail. There are two normal Christian crosses here, but underneath them we have this shape derived from the ancient Egyptian Ankh, the symbol of life, adopted by early Christians in Egypt. When they were unable to declare their Christian faith, they substitute their crosses for this Ankh, or Anset cross, inherited from ancient Egypt. The exiled Christians finally got used to their life in the desert. There are traces to be found at the Kaga Oasis, which suggests they stayed here until the 7th century AD. For modern Egyptians, living in the desert is not an obvious choice. 94% of the population still lives on the banks of the Nile. But demographic problems have caught up with them. In 1900, Egypt had 10 million inhabitants. It has 100 million inhabitants today, and it is predicted that that figure will rise to 200 million by the end of the century. Leaders have no choice but to free up more agricultural land as they try to feed everyone and relieve the congestion in the old city of Cairo with its 20 million inhabitants. 45 kilometers from Cairo, a new capital is emerging, like a mirage in the middle of the desert. There is a massive project underway to build a city seven times the size of inner Paris. We are building a new capital for Egypt. Behind me, you can see the site of the new parliament. Over there, in front of me, is where the ministries will be. They are currently scattered all over Cairo. This way, all the ministries will be grouped together in the same place. Every day, around 200,000 to 300,000 people come to work here, both engineers and builders. It is a good way to solve the problem of unemployment. Obviously, it's easier to live on the banks of the Nile than in the middle of the desert. But with 100 million inhabitants concentrated around the delta and the riverbanks, it was time to act. It was time to decide to conquer the desert.
Work has begun on the first residential neighborhood. It covers a surface area of 420 hectares and 25 blocks of flats are being built. With the help of publicity campaigns, the authorities are hoping to attract some of the inhabitants of Cairo. In 20 years' time, the new capital should be able to accommodate about 6 million people. Convincing 6 million people to leave the historic city of Cairo to live in the middle of the desert won't be easy, but we are relying on our ability to transform this patch of desert into a paradise, and that's what will make them want to come here. Like the pharaohs before them, Successive presidents of modern Egypt have all tried to build their city in the desert. Most of these new metropolises haven't been the success they hoped for. Whether they like it or not, Egyptians are one day going to have to make the desert habitable. They should seek inspiration from the Bedouins and Berbers who have lived there in harmony with nature for thousands of years.